paper from the post-war years, and I have found the issues from 1950 to 1955 when it folded, and it was fascinating. You know, there's all sorts of stuff. There's columns by Gordon Herbayashi, the famous dissenter. There's editorials on civil rights by Bud Fouquet. There's news stories about uh, events in the Japanese American community. I'd never heard of it or seen it cited, but I then uh, came back to Montreal. But a year later, after I had already started writing for the Nietzsche Bay, I had occasion to take a sabbatical, and I went to Vancouver so that I could look into the history of Japanese Canadians, which I needed for my book, A Tragedy of Democracy, which I was then working on. And I did the same thing. I found uh, the New Canadian, which was sort of the Japanese Canadian version of the Pacific Citizen, and the Continental Times. And so Vancouver was a good place to do research in these newspapers and also to gorge myself on Japanese food, which mm -hmm. unfortunately in Montreal is not very uh, good. <laughs> Sadly lacking, in fact. Vancouver being striking distance from Seattle, I decided to go down and see Chizu and my friends in Seattle, and I went, decided to go down for the Day of Remembrance ceremonies at the University of Washington. It was the 30th anniversary uh, after Frank Dante started it in 1978. So while I was there, uh, I went to look at the catalog of the library at the University of Washington, and I discovered that they had microfilm of the entire run of the Northwest Times. Uh, again, the public library had whetted my appetite. They had only the 1950s issues. So I went and checked them out and discovered that in the first, very first issues were this one-act play and short stories written by John Okada, who was listed in the headnotes as a University of Washington student. Once I got back to Vancouver, a few days later, I wrote to Frank Abe, attaching a sample, and asked whether he was already aware of these writings and whether they would be of use to him in his documentary. <coughs> he wrote back, and I can't imitate Frank's voice, this is amazing. <laughs> I'm going to talk to Okada's family about how they would like to proceed with reintroducing this material to the public. Okada scholars are going to go nuts. Steve Sumida and Sean Wong will go nuts when they hear this. Thanks for thinking of me at the library. I owe you dinner the next time in Seattle. Frank then mentioned that John's brother, Roy Okada, remembered a one-act play performed on campus, which in fact Roy had been enlisted in playing a small part, but that he could remember little else and so they had had no idea of the existence of these writings. Fortified by Frank's interest, I then sent him another piece I had found in my research on the Canadian side of the border, a review of the original edition of Nono no Boy that had appeared in the Continental Times, this Japanese-Canadian newspaper based in Toronto. I didn't know very much about the Continental Times except that it was a three-sheeter with three pages in English, or rather three pages in Japanese and one page in English, and that it had run from 1949 until 1982. So here is Frank's response. Oh my God, <laughs> I thought I would never see this, being such to me an obscure paper. He explained, for 30 years, all most of us ever seen is the blurb published on the back of the initial edition of Carp reprint of Nono Boy. Whatever article it was excerpted from was lost in somebody's file. So I had the exact attached excerpt, but never the full review. So I then uh, decided that it would be fun to talk to Frank and find out more about John Okada. And I sent him further reviews that I had found and other pieces. This is from May of 2008. Dear Frank, while looking in William Peterson's original 1966 Japanese American success story article, I discovered a mention of Okada and a favorable one of that. I had not absorbed before that Nono Boy was referenced in the article people like to say is the foundation of the model minority thesis. It occurred to me to see where else I could find Okada, and I stumbled on these, uh, the wonders of keyword internet searching on four pay databases. What I realized in the process is that these unknown works by and about Okada helped us change and deepen our received image of the author and challenge the received Frank Chin style story about his having produced a solitary project, the novel Nono Boy, that had been shunned due to the machinations of Nisei conservatives. The whole received story needed to be re-examined, and thus I turned to Frank. Since Frank was the great expert on Okada, while I had the larger specialization in Japanese-American history, 
I suggested that we collaborate. One of the nice parts of collaboration with people from other fields is that they can do things that I am completely incompetent with. Mm -hmm. Frank agreed after a good deal of back and forth and ch Frank checking with the Okada family. And we decided we would do an anthology that would contain the newly rediscovered works plus some biographical background and some essays. It would work on the general model of the mini Okubo book that my colleague Elena Tejima Kreef and I and collaborators such as Lynn Horiuchi had put together for University of Washington Press. In fact, even as that collection served as a companion volume to uh, Okubo's own book, Citizen 13660, as a classic about the camps, so too did we think that University of Washington Press might publish a volume on John Okada as a companion volume to No No Boy. And I, they were the first and the only publisher we ever approached. The process, however, proved more involved than we thought. First, Frank and I were both extremely busy. Frank had a demanding day job, and I was not only teaching, but director of graduate studies. And meanwhile, I published free full-length books, plus doing other articles in my regular Nichiren columns. Uh, I decided not to sleep. It would take too much time. <laughs> so Frank and I had almost no contact, except for the few times I went to Seattle. Finally, I took him to lunch. Uh, yeah, I paid. Um, I took him to lunch, and I proposed that we collaborate, and I finally got Frank to commit. And so we started to work on a prospectus and continue to look through sources. As Frank mentioned, it was in John Okada's government file with the WRA that he discovered the clue that Okada had written a poem that would uh, be the, I must be strong. And then I had discovered while doing work at Stanford University an online database of uh, articles in different technical journals. And I discovered the military procurement journal from the 1960s that listed the article by John Okada that we publish in the book. Frank then reviewed Okada's CV from UCLA Library, because one of John Okada's other jobs was working at, as a librarian at UCLA. And then he discovered that Okada had often used pseudonyms. And so he was able to uh, check if there were other articles written under a pseudonym, and we hit pay dirt again with the other thing. Frank then had the brainwave to look through the Frank Chin papers at UC Santa Barbara, and we found Frank Chin's letters to Okada's original publisher, including the correspondence with Okada, which Frank used to beef up his biographical discussion. Uh, again, we came through across reviews of the original edition of Nono Boy in newspapers, some obscure, from Asia and North America. We found lots of little tidbits online in Densho, in the Hoji Shimbun database, which we sent each other and discovered. Uh, discussed interpretation and meaning in a kind of continuing seminar that we continued by correspondence. So our collection of material was ever-growing. And that posed a problem. It was a nice problem to have, but it was a problem. Another problem was that although we worked well together, Frank and I, and shared many basic principles, we also had certain disagreements over language and interpretation. So our seminars increased to us explaining ourselves to each other and our points of, and our positions, and trying to persuade each other. We finally discovered, decided that it would be fine if under our own names in the articles that we published, we presented our own views, but in the articles that we published together, we would speak with one voice. In the end, uh, we ended up writing separately most of the time. Mm -hmm. Next, we have the problem of how to analyze these newly rediscovered Okada writings and put them into context. Neither Frank nor I was a literary expert, and I didn't think that I could do the works justice in my discussion of them. Instead, I finally suggested my friend and past collaborator, Floyd Chung, who is professor of English literature at Smith College in Massachusetts. It turned out that Floyd, when I asked him, had a long history with Okada himself. <laughs> Floyd had done his own research on Okada's career at University of Washington and at Teachers College in Columbia and had even studied the transcripts of the courses that Okada had taken and done background research on his professors. Mm. So Floyd was a natural choice. He not only wrote an amazing essay on the stories and on the play, but his overall suggestions were so brilliant that Frank and I agreed that he should join with us as a co-editor. And thus our little seminar became a trio. And Floyd was, I must say, was very modest about his role. He talked about having a front seat to our collegiality. 
<laughs> the next problem was that the biographical information that Frank had uncovered in his interviews and the preparations for his documentary film had proved more abundant and intriguing than we had thought that could fit into just an introduction. So meanwhile, since No No Boy took place in Seattle, it was natural that Frank wanted to shed further light on the places mentioned in the book and the physical community that is very much a part of No No Boy. So on the one hand, he wanted less of Okada the person and more of Seattle as a character. And when we finally got to the prospectus, we had some words about that. So here's what I wrote to him. Dear Frank, I think that while the location of the novel is clearly Seattle, and your tour of the sites of the novel is quite interesting, the place of the book is at least as much the heart of Japanese America as it is Seattle or any particular area. The post-war years in particular remain the black hole in Japanese American history, and the story of the damage the camps wrought on the Nisei is certainly one that needs to be told. That said, I think we need to be careful not to throw out the baby with the bathwater. I think that the search for John Okada himself and understanding his own twisted history remains a part of our story and an important one. So having got through all of those questions, the final problem, of course I won that time for once, um, a final problem was the stringent word count requirements on the final volume imposed by the publisher. In order to get the promised contract from University of Washington Press, and this after several years of uh, attempts to, to deal with them, we had to agree to cut the manuscript by something, was it 40%? Oh, yes. Yeah. Poor Steve Sumita had to suffer death by a thousand cuts in his essay um, as we tried to cut it down for him. And Frank himself was forced to jettison a good part of his biography. So I hope he'll leave it in an archive somewhere for somebody to get the full story. I felt deeply the loss of my own contributions. I had written a major piece, I thought, on the history of internment camp literature, quote unquote, that situated Okada's achievement. And I also had done a, an extended article based on excerpts from the original reviews of Nono Boy, again, which gave the lie to the story that the novel had just been ignored in 1957. However, in the end, I had to cut something like half out of it. Mm. Although thankfully, I was able to use some of the material in my Nichibe columns, and another part went into another scholarly uh, project. Meanwhile, my excerpted reviews were first cut down and then excised entirely. I managed to run the piece as a kind of lanyap uh, in good Louisiana style in my online column for Discover Nikkei, the blog of the Japanese American National Museum. So if you're ever interested in looking at the reviews, Frank has published the original texts in his website, and I have a discussion of the texts in Discover Nikkei. But in the same way, I now realize that I must cut short my discussion, as I promised, 15 minutes and no more. So I, too, am cutting half out of mine. Thank you for coming. <laughs>